Um, we're in the middle of a revealed series. You guys are kind of getting something out of this, I hope. And um, this is based upon the prophetic word, one of the prophetic words um, that uh, was given at the beginning of 2022, the word manifest. God was going to manifest. I just want to read, put that, put that definition up there. Manifest, plain, open, clearly visible, visible to the eye or obvious to the understanding, apparent, not obscure or difficult to be seen or understood. This is the Holy Spirit speaking to us by the prophetic that that's what he wants to do this year. He's already beginning to do that. He wants to be plain and open and clear. Um, the word specifically says in 2022, Jesus is going to manifest himself. There will be great visitations, dreams, visions, words, pictures, open visions. The word of the body of Christ is manifest here and now, manifest or visitations. God wants to do that here. And uh, our, our theme verse is John 14, 21. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. So there's, there's something there. It's more than just this. Just he's just going to do it, but there's some conditions involved in that. We're, we've been talking a little bit about that. Um, I've been sharing this every week, but though... We got to understand that here, here's kind of the foundation of this. Um, God is omnipresent; He's everywhere at once. We understand that it's hard to fathom, but He is everywhere at once. But we don't necessarily feel Him or perceive Him uh, that He's everywhere at once. But when God chooses to invade our space, when He chooses to reveal Himself, that is literally what we call the glory of God, the weightiness of God. Or we call the manifest presence. And the word, manif the word presence literally means face to face. So we've got to understand, the God of the universe. I mean, I don't think we catch this. The God of the universe. He created everything. He's always been and will always be. He says, hey, I want to meet you face to face. I want to meet you face to face. And a lot of our upbringing has told us that's not true. But that's what the scripture tells us. I want to meet you face to face. And when you have an encounter like that, I'm telling you, it changes you forever. You're like Jacob who had a limp after wrestled with God. You're, you're marked. You're changed. You're different for the rest of your life. Many of us have had those moments, but we, should, we also shouldn't be looking back at, oh, in 1972, the Lord spoke to me, and I haven't heard him since. Well, we don't want to do that either. We want to constantly be Walking in intimacy with the Lord. So here's the point I want to make. This is the whole point of this whole thing. If God says to us, I want to manifest, reveal myself to you and see an increase of this in 2022, we need to first of all say, yes, Lord. Do it, Lord. And then we need to ask ourselves some questions. What do we need to do to prepare our hearts? How do we, are there any conditions to this? What do we need to be doing to getting our, ourselves ready for this? Because one of the things about manifest presence is he literally, this, this is not just something, oh, I just feel a spiritual thing. It, it literally, you literally feel him with your senses. He literally invades your space. You literally feel him with your senses. So um, we've been talking about three weeks about worship. And uh, worship is one of the keys that unlocks the manifest presence of God in our life. So I'm always thinking about, like, okay, what does this mean for us? When we have a problem at home, at work, neighbor, friend, whatever, we usually are thinking of a natural solution. I can move this thing around. I can strategize here. You know, um, there's nothing wrong with those things. But I'm, I, my call to us this year is with the word manifest. My call to us is to begin thinking spiritually minded first. Holy Spirit, what, what's your solution here? And worship is the key to accessing the presence of God and the voice of God. And so, um, and remember, we're not just talking about worship, the four songs that we sing. We're talking about worship is, a, is, is our whole life. The word worship means, if you break down the English, worth-ship. Whatever you put most worth in is what you worship. So if you think about it in that term, there's a lot of things we can, that can become idols in our life. Right? Anything that we put more worth in 
We can put more worth in our kids. We can put more worth in our job. We can put more worth in things. And we're not even realizing that we're actually by, in our mind, we're bowing down to those things and God becomes lower. And so God's calling us to be worshipers. So let me ask you something. I asked this last week. Do you think there's a way to approach God? All of you, yeah. All of you at once. Yeah. Is there a way to approach God? Did Jesus give us a way to pray? He gave us a way to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be the name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Now, it's great to pray that prayer, but I think Jesus was actually giving us, if you go back and look at it and what scholars say, that this is, was a normal thing that, that they would do back then, is they would actually give you kind of like each one represents something. It's a guideline. So maybe there's a way to approach God in worship. Or maybe better said, maybe there's a way to prepare our hearts to approach God. I mean, God is, he's merciful. He's a good father. We, we, we need to understand that. He says, seek me and you will find me if you seek me with all my heart. All that stuff. He's not trying to be difficult. He's not trying to hide himself. Don't, don't hear that at all. But I think scripture is clear. When you need an answer from God, your heart has to get prepared to hear that. I was thinking about Elijah this week. Uh, the prophet Elijah was running for his life. They just killed all the Baal priests. And he runs for his life for, from the Queen Jezebel. And he's running from his life. And, he, and he's just, you know, he just had this huge victory. And now he's scared to death. And he comes to this cave on Mount Sinai. And there was a mighty wind. And the Bible says, and the, the Lord was not in the wind. And there was a mighty earthquake. And the whole place shook. And the Bible says, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. There was a great fire that happened, and the Lord wasn't in the fire. He was in the gentle whisper. The gentle whisper. So we have to get to the place where we can hear the gentle whisper of God. And sometimes, well, what we've been talking about, that's the holy place. That's the quiet place. And most of the time, we're looking for God in the fire. We're looking in for the earthquake. Man, move something. Move heaven and earth. And God's saying, if you could just quiet for a second, I want to whisper something in here. But you've got to be so still in order to hear it. So last week, we started worshiping, wa walking through the Mosaic Tabernacle. In case you missed it, I, I want to give a little bit of recap on here. Exodus 25, 8 says this. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst, exactly as I show you concerning the pattern of the tabernacle and all of its furniture, so you shall make it. Now, I want to show you a picture, because in the middle of the camp, a million people surrounded this tent. Now, you may not know this, but you can see it's in a cross. God actually gave them the way to surround themselves in the camp, and it was actually laid out like that. So when enemy, enemy armies would come, what would they see? When they came across the children of Israel, center, the tabernacles right in the center, they would see a cross. Isn't that amazing? They didn't even know what they were doing. This was the place God said, I'm going to meet with you in this tabernacle, in this tent. And he gave them a specific way to enter in, enter in and inter interact. So I played this video last week. I thought it would be worth playing again in case some of you knew. and Maybe there's something get something else out of it. As the children of Israel left the life of slavery they had known for four centuries, God led them into the wilderness under the leadership of Moses. Here in the wilderness, the work of stripping away their identity as slaves began. A new culture was being fashioned, one that would reshape their identity and teach them in literal and symbolic ways that God was their only hope and their only source for life. The focal point for their physical camp, as well as the center of their worship, would be known as the tabernacle, or tent of meeting. Moses was summoned upon Mount Sinai, where God would speak to him for 40 days and nights, outlining the culture, giving the fundamental Ten Commandments, and explaining the ethics of this emerging culture he was creating in his chosen people. Upon Mount Sinai, God gave the blueprint for a portable dwelling place, 
where his divine presence would be among the people as he led them forward toward the promised land, their permanent home. There would be an outer courtyard around the tent of meeting, and inside the tabernacle there would be an outer chamber known as the holy place, and an inner chamber known as the most holy place, or holy of holies. Here in the Holy of Holies, the Ark of the Covenant would dwell, and the very presence of God would descend and be among the people. The tabernacle would occupy the center of the multitude, a million or more strong, surrounded by the Levites, who were set aside to care for it and lead the people in the worship of Yahweh. The tabernacle accompanied the children of Israel through all their wanderings in the wilderness, as an ever-present reminder of who they were and who they were becoming. It crossed the Jordan River with them into the Promised Land and eventually found a more permanent home in Shiloh, where the heart of the Israelite worship situated itself for the first three and a half centuries in their new homeland. The tabernacle was the religious heart of the people all the way through the time of the judges. As the time of the kings emerged, the Ark of the Covenant was lost in battle by King Saul, later to be regained but never again to be at Shiloh. Later, King David would bring the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem, and his son Solomon would build the first permanent replacement for the tabernacle, the Temple of God. All right, so that kind of gives you a little bit of understanding of what uh, was happening there. Um, I want to show you this little diagram here. And so this is kind of how it's set up. <clears throat> they would enter through the gates or the entrance of the tabernacle. And the first thing they would do, the people, that, the people that were bringing the offering, they would come to the altar of burnt offerings or the brazen altar. And that person would actually bring a lamb or bull, or whatever they were sacrificing, and they would lay their hands, as is right at the altar, they lay their hands on the bull, and then they would actually confess their sins over the bull, or the lamb. They would confess their sins, and it was a substitute for their sins. And then the next thing you do, I'm sorry, this is a little gro grissom, gro what, gruesome, thank you, put two, two words together, um, is they would take and they would slit the throat of the animal. They would slit its throat and blood would come out. And actually it was the priest's job to collect the blood in a, in a cup there. They would skin the animal, cut the animal up, and wash all the internal parts. This is the person that was bringing the offering. And the offering had to belong to them. It had to be their own animal or something they had purchased. And the priest, like I said, they would take the, the as the blood was pouring out of the neck. I mean, this is kind of gross, isn't it? Pouring out of their neck, they would take it and fill it up with a cup, and they would sprinkle it, or they would actually throw it up against the altar of sacrifice. They're doing this all day, every day. And uh, then they would take the meat, and they'd put the meat on the altar. And so this is the priest's job. The people, the, 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 or the priests were the representation for God, the mediator to the people. The average person didn't have access to God. So um, this is as far into the tabernacle that you were allowed to go that if you weren't a priest, okay? Next, the priest would go to the bronze laver, okay? Which is that. Let's go back to that other diagram. They'd go to the bronze laver, and what they would do here is they would wash their hands and purify himself from sacrifice, from sacrificing. Um, they would do this both physic for physical purposes and for ritual purposes, and this is all that was done in what we call the outer courts. The outer courts, you can see there. The next thing they do, they would go into the inner courts behind a curtain into the, what was called the holy place. And they would minister to God daily in there. And we'll talk about what that is here in a second. And then there was a third section, which, which separated by a veil there, that was called the Holy of Holies. And the high priest, only one man that had to be a Levite, only one man in the whole camp of a million people could go into that place once a year. Once a year, he could enter on the Day of Atonement, and they would sprinkle blood upon the Ark of the Covenant and uh, on the mercy seat. And the Ark of the Covenant was where the literal presence of God was. And they would do this for the sins of the nation. 
So this is kind of the whole perp, the whole thing that would happen. Now you might be listening and going saying, okay, that's a great understanding of an ancient worship ritual in the Old Testament, Jeff. That that's great. Great for, thanks for the history lesson. What does that have to do with me? What does that have to do with Jesus, the gospel? Well, one thing I want to say is thank God we don't have to do that anymore. <laughs> I mean, I was thinking, oh my goodness, I don't want to, especially all you. Oh, you animal lovers, man. We've got some people with all these farm animals. Man, you guys treat them like they're your babies. They're more important than your kids half the time. Amen. <laughs> Thank God we don't have to do that anymore. Jesus became our sacrifice. He was the high priest. He literally went into the throne room of heaven. He didn't go into the holy place, the tabernacle that was here on earth. He literally went into heaven and presented himself before God the Father and said, said, Lord, Father, here I am. I'm the substitute. I'm the sacrifice for the sins of the nation. And the Father accepted his sacrifice. He did that in heaven. Thank God for that. The veil, when he died, the veil that separated the holy place from the holy of holies where the, tab- the, the Ark of Covenant was, was split in two. And it signified full access. Every person, no longer, you don't have to be a priest or anything. Everybody that's a believer in Christ gets full access into God and the holy place. I mean, it's amazing. Hebrews 9 tells us, for, God did, for Christ did not enter in a holy place made with human hands, which was only a copy of the true one in heaven. He entered into heaven Itself to now uh, or to appear now before God on our behalf. So then he appears before God, he rises from the dead, and he goes to all the disciples and he says, It's done, it's finished, your sins are forgiven, you are born again into the kingdom of God. I now have the authority over sin and death, and I'm giving you that authority right now to the church. So, what does this tabernacle have anything to do with us? Well, I, I just, as I've been chewing on this more and more, I just can't, I can't shake it. I'm not sure, maybe the Lord needs to give me a dream or something because we don't quite know exactly, but it's, it, it's an actual picture of spiritual worship that's happening in heaven. That's what the Bible tells us. It's a guide for how to enter into worship, enter the Lord's presence, and it all points to Jesus. Everything in the tabernacle points to Jesus. Listen to this. Hebrews 8, 5, the priests on earth serve in a temple that is but a copy modeled after the heavenly sanctuary, a shadow of the reality. I mean, think about that for a second. For when Moses began to construct the tabernacle, God warned him and said, you must precisely follow the pattern I revealed to you on Mount Sinai. So, so here's the whole point. God gave Moses a Mount Sinai. He took him up somehow and showed him that he was up there for 40 days and 40 nights. He showed him a picture of heaven and how, how to approach the throne of God. And he says, now I want you to go down and I want you to make a tabernacle that is an exact replica of what's here in the heavenly realms. I know that's something to think about. And the people won't necessarily understand all this, Moses. They won't know exactly what they're doing, but I'm teaching them how to approach me. So the physical tabernacle is a copy of the original in heaven. I don't know. Maybe it's just me. It just blows my mind. Think about it. This is a mystery of God that we probably won't find out until we get to heaven. But then we hear 1 Peter 2.5 says... And you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. What's more, you are holy. Everybody say it. Priest. Through the mediation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. So we have to understand now that what was done in the physical, we now do in the spiritual realm. What was happening on that mosaic tabernacle all those years ago, we now do in a spiritual sense. And I want you to, I'll just, a few verses come to mind. Think about Ephesians says, we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. We're seated with Christ in heavenly places. What about Hebrews tells us, and so dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter the most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. He's talking about the heavenly place in heaven. Philippians says, our citizenship is in heaven. 
So let's think about this. This is a mystery here. We, we can't wrap our brains around it, but, that's, but it's clear that through Jesus, when we enter into worship, we are leaving this world and enter, enter, entering into a spiritual, into a heavenly reality, and we are fellowshipping with God at the throne of God. That's deep. That's deep. So the tabernacle has significance on how we worship then. Because that's what's happening in heaven. One day we'll be there, but the Bible's telling us actually we can enter into pieces of that in our worship. So last week we focused on the, on the outer courts. Let's recap that on how to approach God. Uh, if you missed this message, I encourage you to go back and watch it cause, or listen to it because there's just a lot of stuff here I'm kind of skipping over. But how do we approach God in the spiritual using a physical tabernacle? So first of all, we enter in the gates. Let's go back to that diagram. Enter in the gates with thanksgiving and praise. We come in with thanksgiving and praise. Who's the gate? Jesus. That's the, that's the Sunday school answer, always Jesus. <laughs> we enter in through Jesus. We enter in understanding, first of all, that we can even come into the temple because of G, in, the, in the tabernacle because of Jesus. We also enter in recognizing his blood and his cross. So we enter in with thanksgiving and praise, thanking God for what Jesus has done in our lives. That's how we, that's the first thing. Then we come to the brazen altar of sacrifice. Right there. Go back to that diagram if you don't mind. Just keep going back to that. We understand we can only even enter into this place because of the sacrifice Jesus made. But we also recognize worship requires an altar. Worship requires a sacrifice. So we lay down our dreams. We lay down our plans. What we, we lay down what we think we should deserve or, or we should have. We lay down unforgiveness. We lay down our sin, our hurt. Our lay, we lay it all at the foot of the cross and sacrifice. We say, Lord, here's my offering. It's ugly, but it's all I got. I lay it down at your feet, Jesus. Worship means to literally bow down. We're bowing down and say, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. You cannot go any further in worship until you've learned how to submit to the will of God. You just can't. You're going to be stuck there your whole life. Romans 12.1 says this exactly, I mean, I don't know how you can say it any more perfect. It's the word of God. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you, give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Isn't that just a beautiful verse? I just, it's one of my favorites. So, next we go from there to the to the. Bronze labor, Let's, that's perfect. And go back to that other one. Bronze labor, that's the next place we go to in our spiritual sense of worship. And this is where we get washed by the water of the word. When we, his word, we read it, we meditate it, we, we hear it, we cleanse, it cleanses us, it cleans us. I said this last week, as I'm preaching to you the word of God, I am cleaning you. Not me, but the word of God is cleaning you. Cleaning your spirit. You, and this is the place where you come to self-reflection, not necessarily based upon, well, so, well, Ricky over there, man, he's doing a lot of bad stuff. At least I'm not doing that. No, we don't, we don't compare ourselves to other people. We compare it to the Word of God. We let the Word of God be our mirror, and we say, Lord, is there anything in my heart that offends you? Oh, Lord. So this week, you like that one, J.J.? This week, we're entering into the holy place. We're in the holy place. Remember, that only the priests were allowed to, to go into the holy place. And what are we? We are priests. So we have access. The outer courts was noisy, stinky, chaotic, loud. I mean, a lot of sacrifices going on every day. I mean, it was not. The inner courts was quiet, smelled like fresh bread and incense, and it was dimly lit. The outer courts was the place that God was ministering to us. He, was, he saves us. He forgives us. He heals us. He delivers us. The inner courts is really where we start to minister unto God. The outer courts is like a family picnic. The inner courts is like an intimate dinner with your spouse. Totally different place. And many Christians 
rarely or never go into the holy place spiritually. They stay on the outer courts. They're saved. They love God. They sacrifice. They serve. God heals them and delivers them and forgives them, and they're, they're going on. But they never enter into the place of real communion with God where he wants them to go. I don't know about you, but have you ever been in a worship place? Maybe it was in here today. And you're worshiping, and suddenly the whole atmosphere of the room changes. You were thinking about lunch. You might have thrown out a hallelujah in the middle of that, but you were just like, hallelujah. Yeah, oh, man, Dickies. I can't remember. <laughs> Nobody really likes Dickies. I get it. I go there, but I like it. You're doing all that, and all of a sudden, something switches. Something changes, and you're like, we're in holy ground. We're on holy ground. Like you, you begin to get focused on the Lord. You begin, he begins to minister to you. You fit, sense this joy. You, you sense the presence of God. You just walked into the holy place. You just stepped in. We have to go there. We cannot be stuck on the outer courts, guys, if we're going to really walk in all God's called us to. We want to, that's the place where God manifests himself. That's where we get the oil of joy, the peace that surpasses all understanding. It's where we're filled with boldness and purpose, and we just enjoy being with the king. He downloads mysteries and reveals things about our future and our purpose and our calling. It's all those places that God does that. We've got to go. Can we go in? Can we, let, can, can we get in? Let's go in. Now, I, I had a really cool idea. I, was gonna, I had bought this menorah, which is a lampstand. I bought it, and it was about this big. And uh, I thought, man, this, you know, you know, it'd be really cool. When I said, let's go, dim all the lights, light the candle, and I was going to speak right next to the menorah. So I, I went to Amazon this week, and I ordered a really cool uh, menorah, which is a lampstand. And uh, I ordered one, and I was like, man, this is perfect. This is going to be great. You know, it's going to be about this big, and I'm going to light it, and we're going to. And so I did it. Um, I went to Amazon yesterday to their little they didn't deliver it home because I guess I had to take it to some hub or something. And I get it, and I was like, this little tiny box. I was like, man, did I read that wrong? Um, and I was like, uh, maybe you got to put it together. And so I opened it up. There you go. Warm myself by the fire here. I was like, wah, wah, wah. <laughs> so you'll have to picture in your mind where we're going. I couldn't, I couldn't pull off uh, what I wanted to do. I'll leave it there. At least you can see. Maybe if you get a magnifying glass, you can see what's going on. There. All right. So we're going to go in. So the first thing that happens when you enter in, into the holy place is you're going to see three things. On the right side... You're going to see the table of showbread, or it's also called the bread of presence. On the left side, you're going to see, go back to that, uh, sorry, go back to that diagram for a second. You'll see the golden lampstand, and then right in front of you, you'll see the altar of incense. So let's talk about the table of the bread of presence. It was a small table, only about two feet tall. They didn't, they didn't use chairs back then. They would lounge on pillows and things like that. It was made of acacia wood overlaid with pure gold. On the table were loaves of bread and cups of wine. And the wine was to be poured out as a drink offering. It's actually interesting that they actually have um, pictures of this in the uh, Arch of Titus in Rome. I want to show you a little picture of that. It's pretty cool. So go to that one slide there. Uh, keep going. I hope I put it in there. Maybe I didn't. I thought I could have sworn I did. Did you not, did you not see that on there? Oops. Gosh, well, that was anticlimactic. Sorry. Um, but on the, um, in, in Rome, they actually have, it's like a, I don't know if it's a statue, but it's an engraving in the arch. Anybody ever been to Rome and seen it? Okay, there's one. Uh, and it's actually both the table of showbread and the menorah from um, the temple days, which they think was an act, probably pretty exact replica of those things. And so you actually can see that exactly what it looked like. It's pretty cool. I thought I had a picture of it, but I guess I messed up there. But um, So anyway, on the table were 12 loaves of bread for each tribe of Israel. 
And the bread was literally called the bread of face or faces. Remember, presence means face to face. And the priests would eat the bread throughout the week in the holy place. The bread of presence, they would eat it, and then they would replenish it each Sabbath. And the bread was like the covenant with God. He was going to take care of the children of Israel. He would always be with them. And they would eat the bread of presence in, or the bread of faces in the holy place. This was like a prophetic act. Can you imagine Jesus with his disciples on the night that he was betrayed as he began to, to, to unfold to them communion? They had been seeing all of this their entire life. They were all Jewish people. They understood that. They, they, they understood as they were celebrating Passover, they, but they understood the tabernacle. They understood all these pieces. And Jesus pulls out these symbols of bread and, and wine and says, look, I'm going to tell you what this is really about. That's about me. All these hundreds and hundreds of years, the priests have been doing this. They didn't quite understand what it all meant, but then they're saying, look, I'm telling you, it was all pointing to me. Communion means to share or experience together intimate fellowship. Jesus said the, the, bot, the bread represents his broken body and the, blood, the, the wine represents the blood poured out as an offering and a new covenant that he was forming with the people of God, the forgiveness of sin and eternal life. So John 6, 5, 1 says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. So the showbread points towards the communion or the intimacy and fellowship with Christ. Not just doing things for him, but doing things with him. Being with him. Christ literally invites you to partake with him. To identify him with him in his death and resurrection. This is more than an event that we do on Sunday mornings to take communion. Actually, all it's doing is pointing to this. You can have communion and fellowship with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I want to read you in Revelation something. This is to the letter. There are seven churches in Revelation that Jesus was talking to. He says, write this letter to the angel of the church in Laodicea. This is the message from the one who is the amen, that's Jesus, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's new creation, I know all the things you do, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other. But since you are lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have everything I want, I don't need anything, and you don't realize that you are wretched and miserable, poor and blind and naked. Does that sound like a culture right now? I am rich, I have everything I want, what do I need? So I advise you to buy gold from me. Gold that has been... I'm kind of going back and forth. The next, let's go to the next one. Gold that has been purified by the fire. Then you will be rich. Also buy white garments from me so you will not be ashamed for your, by your nakedness or an ointment for your eyes so you will be able to see. I correct and I discipline everyone I love. So be diligent and turn from me from your indifference. Now listen to this. Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice, open the door. I will come in. We will share a meal together as friends. Now, this was not to unbelievers. This was to the church. Jesus is on the outside of the door saying, I don't want to just be your Savior and your Lord. I want to be your friend. Repent of your self-sufficiency. Repent of your pride. Don't you realize you need me? Don't you realize I am your daily bread, your sustenance? I want to speak to you. I want to share my heart with you. I want to love you. Have you ever just got on your knees before and said, Lord Jesus, I just want to know you. I just want to know you like you know me. I want fellowship with you. You know, one of the things I've realized, some of the most 
intimate people or who have the most intimate relationship with Jesus are the ones who've gone through the most pain. Recognize. I need God. Pain and trials bring you to your knees. I was thinking about my mother-in-law, Kathy, who just a few years ago went through one of the most grueling things in her life, had uh, cancer. They had found cancer all through her entire, her entire spine was filled with cancer. And in fact, she was in so much pain they didn't recognize it um, because the cancer had eaten away, I think, one, possibly two of her vertebrae. And her muscles were in such cramping so hard, they were the only thing keeping her from being paralyzed. I mean, they were just, she was just in constant pain because the muscles were holding her spine together to keep her from being paralyzed. And they somehow missed it, missed it. She was going to chiropractors, all this. They missed it, missed it. And finally, someone, they took a, a, an MRI, and the doctor says, you need to get in here quick. Get her in a wheelchair immediately. One step off of something, and she's paralyzed for life. And she tells a story as she was being wheeled back there for surgery that was multiple, multiple hours. And the doctors were saying, we, you know, how doctors are. We don't know if this is, this, you could be, wake up and be paralyzed. We don't know what's going to happen. Nobody could go back there with her. And she's sitting there. All she had was the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, come, he had warned her actually months ahead of time that there was going to be an intervention. There was going to be a moment that happened, and this was it. And he told her, he says, we're just going to go to sleep. Woke up. She's been cancer-free for five years. Walks around totally fine. <laughs> Power of God. She says it was those moments that she had been closer to the Lord and the Holy Spirit like she had never experienced in, the in her entire life. It's like he was just right there talking to her every day. That's the call of God for every one of us. John 15, 4 says, Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. This brings us to the next thing, which is the lampstand, which is not actually in sequential. Everything else, you walk from one thing to the next. Let's go back. To, I'm sorry to keep having you go back. That's, well, they've already got a picture of it right here. They're fine. <laughs> Do you notice the table of showbread or the bread of presence is right next to? They're in perfect order and perfect alignment. The lampstand represents the Holy Spirit's power and his fruit. It's because without intimacy with Jesus, you can't have the power and fruit of the Holy Spirit come out of your life. You know, not, not to be a little bit crude, but I have four children. They are the fruit of my life. Do you understand that all four of them came out of an intimate place? Intimacy actually produces power and fruit in your life. The lampstand had seven branches, and it was not candles, but were wicks, and had olive. Let's go, let's go back to that picture, actually, because they can't see this. Um, and, it, and it was fed, fed with olive oil. I'm not exactly sure how they did it, but fed with olive oil. And... Um, Exodus 27 tells us, You shall command the people of Israel that they bring to you pure beaten olive oil for the light, that a lamp may regularly be set up to burn. In the tent of meeting, outside the veil that is before the testimony, Aaron and his sons shall tend to it from evening to morning before the Lord. It shall be a statute forever to be observed throughout their generations by the people of Israel. Is everybody still with me on all this? We st we staying connected? Okay, a couple of you are. Okay. The priest's job was to keep this fire burning all day, all night, to tend to it. Keep the oil, and they would trim the wicks. It couldn't go out. This is a perfect picture of the Holy Spirit in our life. Oil is the picture of the Holy Spirit. The flames of the fire is on the, were the same flames of fire on the day of Pentecost, where the Holy Spirit was poured out 
on all people. Do you know what today is? The day of Pentecost. He wants to do it again. He wants to do it again. We've got to constantly keep the fire of the Holy Spirit burning. And I want you to listen to this. Revelation 1.4 says this. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and was and is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne. Now remember what we said? The word of God says the tabernacle is a copy of the original. Seven spirits at the throne of God. And you have a lampstand with seven flames. So the lampstand represents the power and the work of the Holy Spirit in the church and the lives of individuals. Now I want to read you something real quick, and I've got to hurry here. But Revelation 2 says, To the angel of the church in Ephesus write the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand. Who walks among the seven golden lamp- lampstands? I know your works, I know your toil and your patient endurance and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. So he's saying, you're doing a lot of stuff right, church, but here's the one thing I have against you. You have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. The lampstand represents the fire and the oil of the Holy Spirit in the church. The work of His Holy Spirit is signs, wonders, miracles. The fruit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. The disciples could not do it with about the baptism, the Holy Spirit, and fire. How do we think we can? How can we? They were running around scared the day after Pentecost, afraid somebody was going to get them. The next, then all of a sudden the baptism of the Holy Spirit comes, and, and there's power comes upon them. They changed the world. Why do we think we can do it now with programs? And production. And being relevant. We can't. How do we keep the oil and the fire burning? We return to our first love. We go back to intimacy. So the work of the Holy Spirit in this paramount for the church and for the believer. You can't be with him. Now I want to show you something real quick that I thought. Maybe it's just me. It's probably just me. But I was just really... Because there's a scripture in Zechariah that we quote all the time. And it's so cool. So Zechariah the prophet had a vision. And in the vision, well, let me set the stage here. This was after the temple had been destroyed. Jerusalem had been destroyed. It had been leveled. There was no more temple. He gets a vision. And in the vision, the Lord starts talking about rebuilding the temple. He starts talking about rebuilding uh, the, the city gates and all this kind of stuff. He says, I'm going to rebuild this again. And he gives him a vision. And in the vision, he sees a lampstand with seven flames, just like the one in the tabernacle. He sees this vision. And the angel asks him, do you know what these mean? And he responds, no, I don't know what they mean. Now, he would have understood what the, tab- what the, ta- the, the, the lampstand was. He would have had the understanding. What the angel is really saying is, do you understand the, the meaning why I'm showing you these things? And he's going, I don't understand why you're showing me these things. And so as he's looking at the lampstand with the understanding that he's about to have to, you know, that he's pro- prophesying that the temple is going to be rebuilt. And he's looking at the lampstand and he gets this word from the angel. Now, now you guys will all know this. The most famous probably words in the Bible. I never knew that they were connected. He's looking at the lampstand. He says, I'm about to ask you to do something impossible. You're about to go and, and, and rebuild this temple. And then he says the word as he's staring at the lampstand. He says, not by pa- might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. saying you can't do it you can't do it without the power of the Holy Spirit working in your life you can't do it we have an impossible task ahead of us guys we have a culture that's turned its back on God we have a a new generation that is post-Christian 
We have to have the lampstand, the power of the Holy Spirit's work in the church, moving in mind. Let me ask you this. We can't minister to the spirit of man without the spirit of God. All we can know how to do is minister to the soul of man. And we know how to do that really good. We can do things that move you. We can say things that make you feel better. We can show you the five ways to be a better person or to overcome addiction and love more. But no, without the Holy Spirit, you can't get to the spirit of the man which actually changes him from the inside out. You have to have the Holy Spirit's work. The Holy Spirit comes with gifts and fruits, power and character. A church without the Holy Spirit, I want you to listen to this. A church without the move or the work or the lampstand of the Holy Spirit has a few characteristics. I want to name what they are. They're powerless. No supernatural miracles, no healing, no deliverance, and it's a church that doesn't know how to worship. It also is a church that lacks love, lacks self-control, and there's a lot of compromise. I don't care what they say. I don't care what it looks like. And I'm not pointing any, I don't have no church in mind. I'm just saying in general, the Holy Spirit moves. He does two things. He gives you power and character. Power and love. And so many people have been so disillusioned because we've talked a lot about power, but then they sense a church that has no love. You've got to have both. It's actually why I think so many people have been turned off. They've seen all this craziness going on, but then they go, where's the love? Where's the deep love and commitment to one another? Let me just say, if you've been struggling to overcome, overcome in your walk, if you need the power of God, if you need self-control, if you need boldness, if you need to learn walk in love, I want to invite you to ask the Holy Spirit to change you. Tonight at 5 p.m., we're going to have a service. I'm almost done. I'm going to ask the worship team. Tonight at 5 p.m., we're going to have a service. And we're going to ask, I'm going to ask anybody who wants to come up, we're, just, we're going to spend a little time just praying. I'm going to give a short little message on the Holy Spirit. And we're just going to pray for one another. And we're going to go into that deep place. And we're actually going to have a meeting before the meeting. If anybody really wants to come, come at 4 o'clock. We're going to pray from 4 to 5 in here. And then we're going to start worshiping at 5 o'clock. So I'll just invite you to guys to do that. So the last two pieces, I'm not going to spend much time. I'm just kind of blade, But I want to just say a few things about the altar of incense. The priest would burn incense twice a day. This represents the, pow- the prayers of God. Of God's people. Psalm 142 says this Accept my prayer as incense offered to you in my upraised hands as an evening, as an evening offering. So let me just say this is just isn't your prayer list, this is intercession. Hearing God's heart and praying what's on his heart. Have you ever been, let me ask you, has you ever been in a prayer time and you're like you're praying something and all of a sudden it's like you get in a vein? And you're like, dude, what's going on? You feel electricity coming. Anybody ever expect that? It's like, dude, I'm praying. I'm praying something really powerful. I mean, there's been times I've been in. I pray in here a lot because I like to walk. And there's moments where I'm praying. Oh, okay, Lord, help my family. Help my da da da. And all of a sudden, in the middle of it, it's like I just caught fire. And I'm like, I'm praying something really important here. I, I physically feel it. It feels like electricity. Remember the words of Jesus. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and you will have it. Okay, well, I, what does that mean? Ask anything I want and I'll have it? Well, here's the thing. When you get in God's flow, when you get in the holy place and you begin to hear what's on his heart and you pray what's on his heart, stuff happens and gets accomplished. You're praying his heart. And let me just say, there's nothing wrong with praying things that are on your heart, the things you've been praying for. Year, I have things that I pray for for years and years and years. Pray for family. Pray for, for provision. But... Jesus says, keep asking, seeking, and knocking. But God loves his children. He cares what's on their heart. Let me just say, I don't want to put that out there, but let me just say this. There's something that happens when you begin to hear the heart of the Father and you pray that. That's intercession. Just because I... Well, let me just say, our authority is not our authority. It's Jesus' authority that he gives us. So that when we start praying, we're praying his authority. So if he doesn't want something to happen, it's not going to happen. If I want to pray for Tesla, Lord, I want a Tesla. Give me that SUV Tesla, Lord. I please, I pray, Lord, as I leave this service right now, that that 2006 Honda Odyssey with 170,000 miles would actually be replaced by a Tesla. I just, I, I believe it. Maybe he'll answer. I don't think so. 
But listen to this, John 5, 14. And this is the confidence we have towards him. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know what he hear, if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we've asked for when we pray according to his will. How do we get his will? We get in the holy place, we spend time with him, we're, we're in fellowship with him, and he speaks his heart and says, This is my will. This is what I want to accomplish. I mean, honest, I don't really have a prayer list that I hardly pray through anymore. I got a few things that I pray through, but you know what most of my prayer time looks like, and I'm not like the, you know, God's man of prayer up here. But I'm just letting you know what I, I. It just changed. I'll get in and I'll begin to worship. I'll read His Word, and then I'll just kind of get up and walk, and I will just listen and listen. I may pray in the Spirit a little bit, and then all of a sudden I'll feel a download, and that's what I'll just begin praying the heart of God. And I'm telling you, stuff changes. I can. I can I can't go into it all, but I can tell you one thing after another in this church that God, I was just like, Lord, I need you to do this. I need you to do this because I felt like I'm praying the heart of God, and it happens. That's what spirit prayer looks like. So um, I just want to end with this, and then we'll, we'll close. And we'll, There's a guy. Anybody ever heard a guy named Reese Howes? Reese Howes, anybody? Reese Howes. All right, couple, all, a couple of you there. There's a book that uh, it's, an, it's a biography about him. Reese House called Reese House Intercession, and um, he was a man that lived in the 30s and 40s. And God had given him amazing prayer life and intercessor intercession. And um, they would spend hours and hours and hours in prayer and see amazing miracles happen. Listen to this. Few people illustrated the prayer life of spiritual warfare more clearly than Reese House. There is a reason to believe that he and his team had a huge impact on World War II. Hitler's strategies were revealed to Reese and his group of intercessors ahead of time. They would pray and Hitler's armies were defeated. His stories read much like those of the prophets of the Old Testament. One of the outstanding guidances of the war occurred in 1941. There was a night when Reese Howes announced that the Lord had told him that Hitler's forces were, were turned towards the South uh, Mediterranean area and were preparing to attack Russia. Now, there was no intel on this. Nobody had said anything. This is no such eventuality was indicated in any way at this time. But several weeks later, the telephone rang in the school on a Sunday morning, and I heard the voice of Reese Howes from the college. Have you heard the news this morning? Hitler has attacked Russia. The war on Russia front was watched closely in prayer, concentrated as the Lord directly directed. And the guy writing this says, I still have the newspaper cutting of December 22nd, 1941. Moscow, Moscow was ready to fight to the last. And the thing said, it read, mystery of Nazi failure. Their de defeat seemed in inevitable. And it's too early to say how Moscow was saved from the capture in the middle of October and again in the circling moving that followed. It was a miracle, a miracle indeed. But after intensive prayer, the Lord had given us before the insurance that Moscow would not fall. It seemed that the Holy Spirit was ahead of the enemy. Outsta outstanding again was the victory at Stalingrad, a city that the enemy had actually entered and fierce fighting was going on in the streets. And as we prayed, it seemed as the Holy Spirit took us right into the city and drove the enemy out himself. It was the first time that the Nazis had lost in which their troops had actually entered. That's the power of prayer. We don't even know this guy's story. Their prayers actually changed World War II. So I'm going to ask everybody to stand up here as we close. I know there's a lot of teaching today. I know there's a lot of information. Some of you guys probably feel like you're dr drinking from a fire hose. I apologize. But I wanted to get this, um, this out because we're going to be kind of switching next week. And... Um, Let me just go through the pattern one last time. We enter in with thanksgiving. We come to the brazen altar. We offer ourselves as a sacrifice. We come to the 
water basin, and that's the place where we let, let the Lord, you can do this in your prayer time every day, we let the Lord, Lord, is there anything in my heart that you need to fix? We go to the showbread and we have communion with God. We literally spend time in the presence of God. Just spend time with Him. We allow the Holy Spirit to fill us, empower us, and change us. And then the Lord uses that to go straight to prayer and intercession. And what happens? We literally are in the presence of God. This is not a formula that I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to tell you some guidelines. I want to pray. And then I'm just going to dismiss us. And anybody who wants to come out tonight and just spend time with the Lord and get a touch from God, I encourage you to come. Um, no pressure. But I just want to pray us out here. Lord, we just thank you for your presence. We thank you, Father, for the truth of your word. That's transformational. And I pray tonight, Lord, as we enter in a place of worship and prayer and spirit-led prayers, God, I pray... Holy Spirit, you would fill us up, Lord. On this day of Pentecost, 2,000 years ago, you did it. And Lord, we say, do it again. Do it again. Pour out on your sons and your daughters. Young men, dream dreams. Old men, see visions, Lord. On every heart, Lord, we pray in the name of Jesus. God, teach us how to enter into worship. Teach us how to love you. Teach us how to go after you with all our heart, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm going to formally re release you guys. God bless you. Have an amazing, amazing week. We hope to see you tonight at 5 o'clock. All right. I'll keep, I'll keep this up here in case you want to just come by and look at it.